Good morning and welcome to CABE webinar for Wednesday 7th of December. Today we're looking at how the fire industry is adopting to IoT technology to bring important live information on life safety fire systems to people's fingertips, including service and maintenance companies, FM companies, the end users and the fire and rescue service. My name is Rosemary and I'll be your moderator today. I'm the Regional Services Coordinator for CABE and I'll be acting as same moderator for this uh, for this session. We like to make our webinars as interactive as possible, so we do encourage you throughout the session to send in any questions as we go along, which we'll address with a question and answer session at the end. If you're watching us live, you can use the side panel to send your questions in, and the speaker will host us the questions at the end of the webinar. Alternatively, you can get in touch with us via the social links now on screen. Let me introduce you to today's webinar speaker. Mick Bull is the business manager for Honeywell. Mick has been in the fire industry for 20 years and has worked from top brand manufacturers. After six years with Morley IS, Mick moved to another leading manufacturer for four years to expand his knowledge on indi indicating equipment. Mick has also spent a year selling radio systems in the fire industry to give him further knowledge in fire systems on the wireless side of the industry before moving back to Honeywell with Notifier nine years ago. It brings with him a wide knowledge of product and a strong belief in helping the customer find the right equipment solution for the right application. So if you give me a couple of seconds, I'll hand over to Mick and he will begin very shortly. Over to you, Mick, and I will stop sharing mine. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Hopefully everybody can now see my screen and hear me. Can everybody hear me? Somebody put their hand up or say something if you can hear me. Rosemary, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can hear you loud and clear, ah, thank you. Fantastic, sorry, I do apologize. Um, I wasn't aware. So, okay, um, uh, without any further ado, I, I shall carry on this. this um, thank you very much for joining. Um, this particular CPD is called Cloud Not Clipboard, um, and it's uh, it's basically um, how things are moving forward within the fire industry. Which, if any of you um, you guys out there listening have been involved with at all, you'll understand that we're not perhaps the fastest, uh, and we'll cover that as we go on. Um, so our agenda for the next um, forty-five minutes or hour is is going to um, uh, cover other CPDs that we've got in the series. Um, the Internet of Things, um, where we are in fire and what we're doing in, in the marketplace itself and how we're moving forward. The evolution, uh, which is quite interesting. Um, one of the biggest kickers that we've had very recently in the industry, believe it or not, has been due to the fact that we had shut down uh, because the fire industry was forced to address the fact that the technology by which I'm speaking to you now they had to embrace this level of technology. It was something that we were scared of before in the industry. It's been taken on board, as you'll see as, as we move forward. Cybersecurity and the importance um, of that, obviously, it's, it, it's a, a huge part of, of how we're moving it forward. The benefits of the connectivity and where it will take us, the future, where we're aiming to be. And then uh, a summary, and, and uh, hopefully I will have covered everything off well enough so that you won't have too many questions, but I'll welcome those that, that you do have. Um, so we we've got a range of, of CPDs uh, that we do. There's some of them uh, listed there. I won't uh, linger too much on this particular slide. Um, suffice to say, um, through Rosemary and and the organisation, contact us for any others that you might want to look at <clears throat> moving forward. Are you still there, Mick? Something seems to have gone very wrong with the. I'm still here. Can you not hear me? No, it's gone wrong. I've got some very strange pictures appearing on the screen. It's a it's a video. Um, oh, I'm right, sorry. Have... <laughs> have you? Okay. Were you? I'm guessing that you weren't hearing the audio. I'm not hearing any it. sound? No. 
right it didn't ask me about uh sharing audio uh unfortunately it did before but it, it didn't ask me about sharing the audio so basically this guy is talking about if i, I I'll, I'll move on let let me move on if i can i'll try and stop him um he's got a script basically what he's saying is uh the internet of things is he's having huge input impact on the way we live and, and the way we work uh many people are still trying to figure out what iot actually is um this is a simple explanation by this fella of, of what he thinks it is the internet of things is a huge topic of discussion these days and it's having a profound impact on the way we live and work many people are still trying to figure out what iot actually means simply put internet of things is all devices that have an on and off switch and are powered by electricity or batteries that have the ability to be uh, connected together and share data with each other um, you've probably already have a lot of these devices in your home or office such as smart tv smartphones fitbix alexa and all the rest of those kind of devices as well uh, eventually there'll be many other objects in this category as technology allows things such as toothbrushes coffee pots cars calendars to be connected um, I think at the moment there's already uh, an option out there um, that some of you may be using where you can turn your central heating on from the car as you're driving home. There will be a day when you can wake up to your alarm and all at once your coffee pot will know that you're getting up and start making a cup of coffee. Your smart car will know when to start and come and pick you up. Driverless perhaps even. A bit scary, but it's possibly around the corner. You may even have a car that notify you at uh, your office when you're stuck in traffic. Um, we get live traffic updates in our car on sat navs now <clears throat> there's a possibility that that could link with your calendar uh, and let people know that you're on your way and you're stuck in traffic um, we're already seeing a lot of new appliances uh, and wearables on the market that connect to each other like a, a fridge that can look inside and tell you what food items you're low on add these food, food items to a grocery list on your phone and then order it online internet of things can make our lives easier more productive and more efficient um, but are we ready to live in this kind of world where everything is connected and sharing data? Uh, possibly, possibly not. That's basically what that, that guy is saying in, in that video. Um, and it's where we're going now. And as I said before, the fire industry, because we're driven by legislation um, and, uh, and if things go horribly wrong, which they do from time to time, custodial sentences are actually handed out. Um, and this is what's made people a bit nervous. Let's try and shut him up. So one question that keeps being asked uh, by both end users and system maintenance providers um, and contractors that install fire systems um, when dis when discussing fire systems is that the question, the big question is quite, quite commonly is, is what if? Um, what if you could see the state of status of your uh, fire alarm system 24-7? Um, what if you could monitor the entire portfolio of buildings as an FM company, for example, from one screen without leaving your office or your home? Um, what if you could provide undisputed digitised compliance reports? Compliance is everything these days, especially in the fire industry. Um, because it's driven by legislation, um, compliance is huge. You know, everybody needs to be able to prove that they're doing everything they can to keep each and every one of us safe. Um, so... Uh, yeah, what if you could provide undisputed digitized uh, reports uh, in that sort of system? Um, what if you could introduce a system for streamlining installation and commissioning? From you guys' point of view, dealing with buildings and new builds and all that kind of stuff, if your fire contractor could come in, do a job with 100% compliance and get in and out in a much quicker time based on using the Internet of Things, quite frankly, um, <clears throat> what if we could provide detailed system and site information for service providers? So once the system's in and it's being looked after um, through all that kind of stuff, these systems have to be serviced and maintained. It's a legal requirement. You have to have a maintenance contract on your fire system in a commercial building. Well, what if we could put something in to do with that fire system, which meant that there was no disruption to that building whatsoever? So the people could come in to do the service and maintenance um with no effect to that to that building you didn't have to get a lift engineer to ground the lifts what if you could just do that without these are the kind of questions that that we get thrown at us quite a lot that that fire contractors end users consultants that they're all looking for 
Um, one of the other things that's coming out quite a lot nowadays is based on the fact that everybody's trying to be as green as they are. What if we could put in a system that links to your fire alarm system to help with the planning for the life cycle costs, uh, all from one single report? The particular detectors and things that we're talking about have a life cycle. Detectors that are uh, might be above your head now, if you're sitting in a commercial office, they have a life cycle. Over 10 years, um, the, the Bible that we work to, which is BS 5839 Part 1, recommends that they're changed within 10 years. What if we could have a system that flags up when things get to about seven years old? So you can start putting in a replacement life cycle um, costs uh, for replacing them, maybe over a three-year period. So you'll do 33% of the change out on year seven, 33 on year eight, or 25 on year seven, 25% on year eight, 25% on year nine, and 25% on year 10. Then moving forward, you've got a, um, a budgeted cost for maintaining your fire system that you've, uh, that you've managed to work out. So where are we in fire? Well, for years, the fire industry has been technolo technologically behind the likes um, that we're often quite linked with, like uh, intruder systems, CCTV, door access, um, BMS systems, building management systems, um, and adopting advancements in technology. We've been a bit backward by that. Um, if you look at intruder systems specifically, <clears throat> they have things like touch screens, mobile control, remote diagnostics, biometric readers to get in your, your doors and all that kind of thing, uh, to name but a few. Um, CCTV systems are now so advanced um that we're giving the power um to our consumers in their hands uh to identify individuals from large distances identify vehicle owners just by viewing registration plates um on their cars and that kind of stuff um so it wasn't it was only a few years ago um to, that they were bringing those sort of things in, but they're way ahead of us now. Fire systems in comparison, we still rely on, on reliable physical cable connections, relays, physical, direct control of fire control panel, uh, limited connectivity options, really. Um, LCD screens uh, for most, LEDs for indication purposes. Some of that's changing. We've managed to bring them kicking and screaming um, up to date now, but some of those are, are still there. There has been a reluctance to go beyond the control panels and cables um, and detection and sounder circuits for various reasons. The expectation now, however, is that the industry and end users expect to have direct offsite instant communication with their life safety systems to make the best decisions um, on events being broadcast from their fire life safety systems. Um, millennials of today really are the future of the buildings industry and they will be demanding uh, instant um, uh, and as always all access on to all our fire systems and life safety systems and the systems within those particular buildings they're generally referred to you've probably heard um, the, the, the phrase that uh, that's out there a lot more especially in the industry and everybody's talking about smart buildings and this is basically what we're talking about the fire alarm system becoming part of the smart building so um, you might ask the question, why now? Well, the industry's been waiting for this and wanting this level of detail for a while. Fire installers um, to have a greater visibility of the systems they've installed um, and to have up-to-date information on the device status, uh, condition and health to better form uh, decisions surrounding replacement and compliance. Like I said, compliance is the big word here. Um, and that and that's what we're talking about with this particular system for end users to have a great knowledge of the states of their fire system, as well as the performance of the service provider and the lifespan uh, of the devices connected to the system and the health of the connected devices um, so that they can ensure the costs um, to fully maintain it and that there's no uh, hidden unexpected costs. One of the things that we find with end users, they have to be almost completely trusting uh, in the service and maintenance company that they have looking after their fire system. Nothing wrong with that at all, because <clears throat> if you're doing the job properly, you shouldn't have any problems, and that's the way the relationship should be. But by the same token, the service and maintenance company shouldn't have any issue at all with giving full visible access to that system and how it's working or whatever on the system that they're maintaining. This is basically what we're offering now, so that the end users can see 
that there is complete compliance and that, that the items that are being tested and maintained are actually being tested and maintained to the level that they should be. Um, FM companies uh, can now view all of their buildings and the sites they look after <clears throat> from, from, one, from one portal. They can maintain the whole lot from, from one place. Um, in the future, fire and rescue services can use the Internet of Things and connected buildings to give greater clarity to gain intelligence in the event of a fire condition. Uh, basically, what they'll mean, there's, there's a system that they're using in the States at the moment, um, in particular smart buildings, where the fire brigade go in and through an app that they have on their phone or their tablet, they can actually see who is in what room, in what building, um, due to the way that people have logged in and out when they've gone in. So they can actually see who's left in whatever building. So they can see not only that there's someone else in the building, but they can see where they are in that building. Uh, and it's based on the, 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 the connectivity and the internet things. Finally, specifiers um, such as potentially guys like yourself um, can be more direct in what they're designing systems to and that they're providing future proofing for the systems as well as greater overall intelligence of the whole system installation and infrastructure. <clears throat> Cybersecurity. Now, there's an interesting one. Um, it must be the basis on which the platform is developed. It has to be. Um, can we give assurances that the data we're sending to the cloud is secure, uh, that it's unable to be accessed by those? Um, do we comply with local restrictions? We've all heard of this being thrown around all over the place. Um, it drives me absolutely insane because I'm not allowed to send anybody anything now without getting absolute qualified approval first. The infamous GDPR. Um, how are we monitoring any threat signals from potential hacks into the system? I've got to be honest. Um, in 20 years of being in the fire industry, I've never heard of anybody going in and maliciously uh, isolating anybody's fire system. But um, with where we are nowadays, we have to cover the, the the option that some idiot out there might choose to do something like that. So we have to make sure that it's looked after. Um, how does the system recover in the event of a failure? Um, does this require manual intervention or can it be an automatic function? These are some of the things that we've been asked. Um, one of the other questions that we get asked uh, as well is, is who owns the data? Actually, it's the end users um, owns the fire system and they own the data. It's their system. They've bought and paid for that system. So it's theirs. Uh, we have to make sure that the agreement's in place to safeguard the government so that the governance of the site um, and the users and the fire system data. It's down to them. We need to ensure that the provider of the fire system um, mains is, is following the cybersecurity governance at all times. Um, and we do that, like I said, through compliance and certain reporting uh, on the systems that we're talking about. So to maximise um, the Internet of Things from our perspective, what, is, what does that actually bring uh, for life safety systems? Well, first, by designing a unit that connects with the fire panel, uh, we're now able to bring systems designed in the past and connect them in such a way that they become very visible to building owners, FM managers, service providers, in a way that was never envisaged when the systems were conceived. Bearing in mind a lot of the platforms that these panels work on uh, are running on software that was written so long ago that if basically if you and I were to try and look and understand the software that that's written in, it would be like us speaking to each other in Latin. Um, it's very, very old, the basis. <clears throat> um, so that, that's where the, the actual products are. The Internet of Things enables manufacturers such as Honeywell. Uh, to design fire systems and devices where connectivity to the internet thing and devices is at the very core of it. It becomes now the main part of what we're doing, and that's what we're basing the manufacturer around. We're now, now able to demonstrate 100% testing compliance on devices, uh, no longer having to rely on extracting mountains of data from spreadsheets and it, extracting only what, <clears throat> what you think is needed. Product um, productivity gains for both end users and maintenance companies by making the system easy to understand and give the ability to produce and report um, results and certification literally at the push of a button or the click of an icon um, and have instant access to all reports generated by the fire system. We can now accurately give life cycle costs based on detailed system analysis, not just by numbers. If the device needs replacing, the system is connected um, and it will tell you. You'll get a flag up on an email 
um, on your phone, on your watch. Now, believe it or not, I mean, 15 years ago, who would have ever thought? We joked about being able to talk to people on your watch. It's there. We're actually doing it now, aren't we? And fundamentally, <clears throat> all of these things comply with all the relevant standards to ensure um, compliance uh, against all these things. There we are. It's that word again, compliance. It's going to keep popping up quite a lot. Um, so is it just a panel connection? Well, when we look at how we're to connect to the fire system, we need to understand which method would best for the extraction of the detailed information that we're trying to get out. Um, we've got a connection via the panel's printer port output. This will give rudimentary info that's displayed when the fire system does something, i.e. a fire, fire condition or a fault condition or an isolation or a disablement if somebody's uh, isolates and detection. With a direct connection to the system protocol, um, which is the language that we're the, the systems speaking. Uh, the connection will become part of the makeup of the system. We're now communicating directly with the devices, the panel loops, the loop cards, the panel controls, uh, and all that kind of stuff. Using this connection um, method gives a range of detailed system events, control options, commissioning options, and we're there with that word again, compliance testing, basically. So you can choose uh, how much of this that you use or not on that particular system. Um, we can extract detailed device information, such as device age and device health, to give both the service and maintenance provider, but more importantly, and the end users, the ability to plan the spend and to help elevate disruption caused by false alarms, for example. Uh, the amount of money that they cause across a year is absolutely ridiculous. It literally um, uh, is in the, the, the billions of pounds that, that uh, as taxpayers, we pay for our wonderful fire and rescue service jumping on uh, a pump and going out to false alarms. It costs us a fortune. The information that we can draw through the fire system now, we can control that. We can see what's happening. We can make in, um, informed decisions uh, as to as to whether they're real or not, so we can cut down on them enormously. Um, moving on to the data transmission, how are we connecting um, the unit to the monitoring service? Um, and have we got the ability to connect to, to LAN Wi-Fi or perhaps to a data connection via mobile de services? Um, well, we have. How safe is the information? What are the cybersecurity functions for the system? Where is the information stored? Um, and what measures uh, are in place? Well, fire system connectivity, um, what does it bring? Well, we're now going to have a look at uh, what it will bring um, to you guys, well, to all of us, really, that's out there. So in order to ensure that the testing of the system is 100% complete, we need to be looking at the, the following items, because 100% um, testing on a, on a fire system uh, is a legal requirement once a year. 100% of the system has to be tested. Um, so we're looking at the following things. 100% device testing has been completed. This ensures that all initiating devices have been fully tested or in fully uh, working order. That basically means any detector or any input that it's working properly and that it kicks off when it needs to and it does what it needs to do. We're making sure that the devices have been disconnected within the service period um, and that records have been investigated. This comes under the decommissioned tab. Um, do we have a clear audit trail of corrective actions? We need to know what the engineer has identified whilst on site, what actions are needed to be taken by the engineer to get the system compliant and what actions uh, are required uh, then by, by means of the end user. <clears throat> when we look at the event management and um, being connected to the fire system 24 seven, that gives the end user and maintenance company greater visibility on the following events. Basically, it sort of puts it at their fingertips rather than having to run down to the panel. Um, it's there in their hands. So you'd get fire, um, unwanted alarms, not necessarily false alarms, but unwanted alarm. Um, when somebody burns the toast in a student accommodation, for example, and the detector goes off because there's smoke, that's not a false alarm because the detector's done exactly what it should. It's detected smoke and it's gone into it. It's not a false alarm. It's an unwanted alarm. Um, but on the basis that uh, it might be real, the fire, uh, fire alarm, the, the fire and rescue service respond. So faults, we need to be flagging faults up immediately. You don't need to be waiting until someone walks past the panel to hear it beeping. It needs to flag on the system immediately. So if the end user and the maintenance company are getting uh, immediate alert on their phone, 
on a laptop, on a desktop, they can be much quicker to respond to that, to get back to the system being 100% compliant as fast as they can. Of course, with the technology being what it is these days, we can also add non-fire events. So through linking in various things, through BMS, your building management system, you can put non-fire events through it so you can log and maintain all of them as well. So also having the system connected to the wide world, it gives the end user more protection. If there is an incident within their building, they'll get notification of it. And full records of previous activity, previous faults, rectification works, it's all there on, on the reports and everything else, and, and it's just one click away. Um, life cycle costs. So having your fire system connected also brings with it some benefits to determining the life cycle costs. This is a massive thing for people now, um, maintaining uh, their, their green footprint and therefore looking after the life cycle of their fire alarm system. So <clears throat> it brings with it um, uh, the benefits of determining life cycle costs and it helps avoid what can be sometimes unnecessary costs associated with engineer visits. You can control them more. So um, do you know what devices and assets are connected to the fire system as an end user? Well, you do now. Do you know when the devices were installed? Do you know what the manufacturer's recommended lifespan of the devices are? Well, with the systems that we're putting out there now, yes, you do. Um, what are the condition of the devices and are we having too many unwanted alarms from any particular units? That can be seen and monitored much more easily. And that history is right there. So when the service guy goes in to look after the system, he's pre-armed with a lot of information about what that system's doing before he just rocks up at the site and then drags all that out of the, the memory on the fire panel. Um, knowing all of the, of the, the, the above things that we've mentioned at any one time, it gives the end user a lot more um, assurances on an annual budget that they're going to work for, because obviously these service and maintenance contracts cost money. Um, and it gives them an idea of what they're going to have to use to keep the fire system maintained and working at the optimum condition and to be adhering to compliance. So what do the standards say? Um, well, it's all about section 45 BS 5839 part one, service and maintenance. Um, and for me being able to prove, basically being able to prove that it's that it's done properly. Um, so the reporting functionality of any online portal should be clear, concise and easy to interpret. You've got to be able to understand what it's telling you quite easily. It needs to be readily accessible from those that need to be able to get hold of it and have no difference in any way report available, both end user as well as the service uh, and maintenance company. The report should be able to be driven um, to production in both the browser application and the mobile app, again, showing no differences. So it should be the same information that you're getting on both of the systems, so it's no confliction. Information included on the certificates that this generates, um, it's, it shouldn't be able to be manipulated in any way. They're going to be automatically generated, so you can't tease them and, and play around with them. So it's showing that only the devices that have been physically tested along with uh, any devices that have been missed whilst completing a service visit. There are times and occasions when an engineer will rock up to site to do a service and he's expected to do 25% of the devices that are in that building. Well, he can't get in three or four of the rooms because there's a board meeting going on. If, in a, if it's in a hospital, there's several occasions we have this all the time. They try and get in to do the testing or whatever, and they can't. It might be in a, an operating theatre, which is in use. So they get to the end of the year, those devices haven't been tested. If we're looking at the letter of the law, in theory, that's non-compliance. With the, the information that we're talking about with now, that can be controlled. <coughs> so basically what we're saying is we can keep compliance of the certification and all the information that's on it, and we can make sure it's 100% accurate. Routine service and, and uh, maintenance certificates as well um, as any commissioning certificate should be designed to mimic the paper versions that are currently available, um, which are all handed over. And they should obviously also comply directly with BS 5839 part one, <clears throat> which is the Bible to which we, we work. Um, both the end user and the service and maintenance company will have access to the device age and the device condition. Um, we hear a lot as a manufacturer, I get people phoning me saying, you know, I'm the owner of a building and my service and maintenance company are telling me that they need to change all the detectors in my building. 
um, how do I know there doesn't appear to be anything wrong with them? With the information that we're now giving the end user directly, he can see the device age, he can see 5839 part one, the recommendation. It doesn't need anybody outside of that to explain to that end user that he needs to change it. It's in front of him. <clears throat> Um, so the, the, the information that will be given to him, um, it will include uh, the so the, the following info will be available really to the end user and the service and maintenance company. So it will be the device installation date, <clears throat> the recommended life expectancy of that device. Some devices have a longer expected uh, life expectancy than others. CO detection, for example, only has a life expectancy of six years because of the cell that detects CO. A normal standard smoke detector that we've probably all got in our houses or in the offices in which we work, there'll be 10 years. Um, device condition. Uh, certain devices in certain areas, like in warehouses and whatever, their condition is going to deplete much quicker than that of one in an office, probably, because they're going to be subjected to dust and all that kind of stuff. So it's important that you can see the device condition because although it says that you can have a detector there for, for 10 years, it might be that in the particular environment in which it's put, it might only last seven and then it goes to its thresholds I've been able to clean itself and whatever, and you might need to, to change them then. Um, description of potential false alarm conditions as well and device replacement ID. Uh, that's important because as buildings change, um, internally, you might change the type of device. So if a particular room in a building has gone from being an office where it had a smoke detector and that office has now been converted and is now a kitchen, you'd probably put a multi-sensor in there rather than just a smoke detector because smoke detectors in kitchens inevitably are going to go off all the time. So you'd probably put a heat. So it should be able to tell you the device replacement ID, what's been changed. And obviously, once again, it'll all be recorded on the logs <clears throat> and, and the history. So productivity gains, um, well, the gains for the end user is basically system uptime, <coughs> uh, reduced false alarms because you can see what's going on um, and where or unwanted alarms, increased first fix time. That's huge in terms of an engineer rocking up, looking at it and saying, oh, yeah, it's one of those. I need to replace it. But I haven't got any on the van because I've used them all on previous sites. You've got all that information before you even go. Reduced administration, much less paperwork done because it's all been doing electronically and it's untamperable with then the system life cycle. Obviously, as we've spoken about, um, it gives you a better idea of the condition of your system. This is a life safety system. After all, um, you'd have your boilers looked after if you could smell gas. Mod. The same thing. This is a life safety system and it needs to be looked after and access to enhanced records, not just the same records that we get now, but we can give you better information and clearer information. Um, and they're untamperable and they're all automatically generated. <clears throat> Gains for the fire systems companies. This is the guys and the service and maintenance companies that are installing it and looking after it. Well, it gives them um, better efficient service visits. So the end users getting <clears throat> uh, better value for money for the service visits. And it means the service visits um, are going to be um, as it says, they're more efficient there. When the guy goes in, he knows what he's looking for. He knows what he's servicing. He's got a better control of it, which probably means that that service visit will be quicker. Um, and once again, it's all uh, recorded. Bearing in mind it's quicker that that fire systems company then can utilize that guy on another site, maybe twice in a day rather than just, just the once. So it's more financially beneficial for the fire systems company as well. Easier commissioning. So from your perspective, you guys who are dealing generally, I would guess more with new builds and whatever. Um, it's much more easy from a commissioning perspective when the system's gone in and you're actually walking around and testing it before the building's handed over. <clears throat> it makes it much easier. And once again, all the reports that go with the commissioning are all automatically generated. Better first time fix rate because you can see what's going in and where. Reduced admin, as we've said, there's less paperwork to be handled. Um, enhanced system records, we've just been talking about that. They'll all be generated through the system. Um, and the client retention, if you're showing your customer at an easy base, uh, at right from the start that you can offer <clears throat> your client all of this kind of stuff when you're looking after and maintaining their, their system, uh, they're going to be happier and, and feel more comfortable with it. Um, so serial V protocol panel connection. So serial connection, like through a 232, um, basically you're getting the event only. It's one transmission. You can't, you can't send signals back into the panel. 
Um, I don't know of a fire panel that's in the market at the moment that doesn't do it like this. Most, I'm not sure that all panels have printer ports on them anymore, but most of them would. That's where you'd get that information from. But as you can see, it's quite limited. So protocol panel connection means talking to the panel directly through the protocol and reading what it's doing. So you've got two-way communication, so you can send information back to it. You get all level of events. You can control the sort of events that you get, actually. You don't have to have them all popping up on your phone. You can control them, but you will get a notification if you want of all of the events. Um, you've got system control from the app. So you can change device labels. Basically, what that means is when you have a detector in a room, <clears throat> when it goes into fire, on the fire panel, it tells you where that device is and it will give you what we can what we call a label so it might say uh, downstairs cloakroom without having to go into the panel and type on a keypad or getting a, a laptop out and doing all that you can now do it you can change um, those device labels if the building's moved and changed you can change that um, that information if there's issues on a device and it's gone into fault um, and you need to change it you can disable it for a while uh, if you've got hot or cold works going on you can disable a device so the hot works can go on without setting the system into into fire when the works have been done and you've confirmed that that's all back to normal you can then re-enable without having to go to the fire panel so you can do it remotely interestingly you can also do fire simulation this is really important for cause and effects testing because on on bigger buildings we tend to have uh, a complicated cause and effects mainly to control evacuation because it's all well and good an event coming into a fire system if you just ring in the every bell <clears throat> ring all the bells and everybody tries to get out as quickly as they can you just move the risk basically for it being a fire risk to then a cross risk from everybody trying to pile down the stairs so fire simulation to control the cause and effect make sure the escape strategy works is good also from the phones uh, and from your remote systems you've got si um you can sound the alarms you can silence the alarms if, if it's all in working place and whatever. You can stop the bells ringing because that tend to make people um, panic. If indeed you find out that it's not a real fire and it has gone off by accident, you can actually reset it remotely now. This was the thing that used to scare the life out of people because they didn't want people doing that remotely. <clears throat> it's not quite as easy as, as doing it, just looking up at your phone, hitting the reset button and it all stops. But there is a level of control. Um, another good thing about it as well is finding devices. Some systems that have been in buildings for 10, 15, 20 years and the service and maintenance contract changes. Now it means that <clears throat> they're trying to find all the devices and whatever through using their system on their phone. They can actually go and find where the devices because it might have appeared to have been hidden. Um, but but that's what you can you can do with it. Now you can go and find the devices from it. So. Um, to, to summarize, um, basically it's making sure that the supplier can extract the data that your business needs from an end user's point of view. Uh, we have to make sure that the solution is cyber secure. We have a white paper with our system that we're dealing with people. We have a, a white paper. There are connectivity options available as we've spoken about. <clears throat> you don't have to go for this IoT thing. You can still do it with the other bit, but the limit on information that you get is, is huge. Uh, the next line is important. The products of the future have IoT at its heart. We're being very much driven now um, with our products and where we go um, based on uh, the Internet of Things. It's it's driving us in the way that we do things. <laughs> Along with it, though, we're getting um, easily accessible reporting. There's that word again, compliance. It's huge in our industry because, like I said, it's associated with um, uh, legislation and when things aren't looked after and maintained properly and there is history over the last few years there are custodial sentences that are dealt out to people that aren't looking after their systems properly and therefore endangering the lives of the likes of you and I um, so uh, compliance is massive but also on a regular basis you can watch and maintain the system's health um, basically that that last bullet point says it all um, and it's ensuring um, total compliance. So the industry solution from our perspectives, Honeywell Connected Life Safety Services uh, is what we call it. It's CLSS. There should be a video now, but bearing in mind, I don't know. Can you guys hear the sound? Um, you, you're seeing a video. 
Rosemary, can you hear it? No sound, unfortunately, Mick, no. That's a real shame. I don't know how to get around that, I'm afraid. It's basically speaking about smart buildings. You can see the video, I guess. Rosemary, yep. can you see? Yep. Yeah. OK, basically, it, it's basically the, the narrative behind it is talking about connected smart buildings like we've been talking about. Um, harnessing the power of data to use systems like that, that that we're looking at on the screen now is is actually the that's that's coverage of the kind of information that we're talking about live, a fire system that's giving you that information. Um, from the fire industry's perspective, you know, it, we've we've come we've come forward miles uh, and this is this is what our system's offering now. You can see uh, the images on the screens at the minute of people getting information on their life safety system popping up on their phone, telling them immediately. And it doesn't have to be end users and it doesn't have to be service and maintenance contractors as well, because smart buildings now are lending themselves with this sort of technology that when somebody enters a new building that they've never been in before, um, you can log it on so that they would get notification to get them out of the building. They would get a flag or a text or an email pop up on their phone that would say um, something like a fire has been detected on the fifth floor. Please leave by the nearest exit. They're going to respond to that much quicker than they'll respond to a bell, because when inevitably when bells go off, people look around at each other um, and they wonder what the bell is going off for. Eventually they'll leave. But by getting instant messages. Um, on your phone and information like you can see on the screen. This is one that's actually one of our systems. Um, there it is. Guys, I do apologise for you not being able to listen to the, the music on that. I don't know what happened with that. I thought it was going to share, but clearly it didn't. So and I think um, we're nearly there. Um, just the, the future. Uh, Honeywell CLSS, which is what we've just shown, Connected Life Safety Services. It's the first part um, of a puzzle, really, in the new launches that will be taking place over the next three to five years. Um, first of the new upgrades um, will be the first set of new designed fire panels that, that we're uh, launching in the UK. First one within Honeywell is coming out in January. Um, the first one that we're launching um, will in 20. Um, will be in 2023. It's the Notifier brand, which is who I work for. It's called Inspire. Um, it's replacement for our flagship that's been around for 20, more than 20 years, probably about 30 years. The, 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 the Inspire, it's, it's first of a modular system. We've changed the way the actual fire panels work because um, they're going to be modular now. So you can do hot swapping when there's maintenance need doing on them. But all of these will be connected to CLSS, Connected Life Safety Services. Um, so everybody that has one of these installed in their system. Suffice to say that um, we're in the throes at the minute of talking to Fords and Essex at Dunton. We're using um, talking to Excel. Uh, Excel currently use CLSS uh, at the moment as the Wimbledon, you know, that little tennis tournament that happens once a year. They're covered and they use CLSS for their maintenance because you can imagine through the tournament, if something goes on wrong on their fire systems, they need to know instantly and they need to know where it is and they need accurate information. They use CLSS um, on a notifier system there. <clears throat> um, the next product um, that's going to be benefiting from the, 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 the connected infrastructure is going to be a new range. Now, those of you that know fire out there might sort of look a bit sideways at the screen at this bit, but it's called self-testing devices. So we have the, the ability now um, to actually make the smoke and heat detectors test themselves. So we can test it for ingress of smoke. Uh, we can check that the egress works properly as well so that it's not capped. Um, we can check that the, the heat element um, so it works properly. And then the engineer will visually expect, inspect the device. But visually inspection doesn't mean that he's actually getting in the room. So, for example, if that if that was in an operating theatre, uh, he can test it by testing the device through the self-test. The device will test itself. But if that engineer is standing outside the operating theatre, he can look in and see that it's on the ceiling. He can see it's not hanging off. He can see it's not got a cap on it. That's a visual inspection. That particular device is then 100% um, checked and is therefore compliant with absolutely zero disruption to what potentially could have been a life-threatening operation in, a, in an operating theatre. Uh, and that's the, the real truth of where we're going with it. 
Um, we can test a complete network building in little over 30 minutes. I know that might sound to some of you a little bit sideways again, but it is absolutely true. This is where we are with this stuff. The self-test detectors as well. This isn't speculative. This is we're actually out there. We've got about 23 patents on them. They're arriving in the beginning of 2023. We've got they're using them in the States already. Um, alarm transmissions accredited to in 5421 will be introduced to CLSS, which means you get automatic dialers uh, that enables the gateway to connect um, to utilize um, all three connection paths of the gateway to communicate with the fire and rescue service via a central station. Uh, so they'll get into um, immediate information as well. Um, through firmware updates, um, we'll be able to connect any installed uh, VESDA sniffer systems, um, bring the flow rates, pipe work, filter life and product issues, all that back into the CLSF portal. So it's not just your standard fire alarm systems, all of the systems that are associated with life safety and that kind of thing, we can bring all that info. Third party panels um, from a Honeywell's perspective is also something that we're working with. Obviously, Honeywell have their own brands. The, guy, the, the brands that you guys will probably know of in the UK will be Notifier, Gent and Morley. They're Honeywell brands, but obviously there's others out there that you'll know of, C-Tech, Kentech, Advanced. The next thing that Honeywell are doing, and we're driving this at the moment, is to, uh, is to link for the third party protocols and they'll also be able to brought back into the CLSS portal. Once again, that's giving end users whose portfolio includes non Honeywell fire systems, the benefit of the functionality and reporting features of CLSS, um, which is what it's there. Um, to finish, we'll be able to connect with CLSS to BACnet. I'm not sure if it's gonna be Modbus as well, but systems such as BMS, building management systems, which do basically all your asset management um, in buildings um, and it, it all basically it brings them all to life uh, as well. So EM54 um, part 21 compliant transmission for alarm um, systems as we just spoke self-testing devices the test devices both test smoke and heat without the need for manual smoke and heat poles um, that's going to be massive because the difference between walking in and disrupting an office to get people move out of the way so you can get on a ladder, check the smoke detector, you can do it all now with absolutely zero disruption for that particular building. That's huge from an end user's perspective. It's also huge from the maintenance company's perspective as well, because they haven't got to then tie up with a maintenance man to get the lift in to send the lift to ground and whatever. Um, so the guy going in and doing the testing can be in and out in half a day where it might normally take him to. So the time saved by the maintenance company is huge, uh, potentially then a reduction in the service and maintenance cost because it's more accurate and it's taken less time. Um, all, all being driven by the fact that we've adopted in more technology for self-testing devices and brought them in. Convergence with other products, that's what I was talking about with the third party products now that we're, we're um, uh, <clears throat> dropping in with the likes of Advanced and, and Apollo and all of them. Um, and other products, um, aspirating systems, we know them, most people call them VESDA systems, but aspirating sniffer systems. So you'll be able to see real time uh, access flow rates, filter life, pipe blockages. Now, one of the one of the industries that's got a massive boom on them is, is um, data centers. Data centers rely enormously on sniffer systems with a very, very high sensitivity. And that's more for damage limitation um, rather than uh, event of a, an actual fire. If a component burns out and you get a small wisp of fire, um, a, a small wisp of smoke, these aspirating systems will detect them and it will set them off. But during the time that that small component has gone down, the likes of Vodafone, for example, might lose 30,000 um, consumers that haven't got access to their phones anymore. They need to know about that immediately. Well, if that system is then popping onto CLSS, whoever's maintaining that gets instant notification immediately. So everybody involved in getting that back up and running knows about it. So it's damage limitation as well as being able to, to stop the fire. Uh, third party systems we've spoken about. Backnet I mentioned, Backnet and Modbus uh, running through BNS, BMS systems is an important one there's the modbus one voice alarm and public address systems now voice alarm is coming on much more into the marketplace 
uh, rather than having electronic sounders and whatever, because a voice alarm, people are going to react better if they hear a, a message that says, bing bong, a fire has been detected on the third floor. You're going to react differently to if you just hear a siren going off in the background. It's telling you what to do. It's telling you there's a fire. It's advising you to leave uh, via the nearest exit. Once again, it's a voice alarm. Um, it's uh, it's part of the life safety system and it's controlled. You can see the condition and the health of it through CLSS, through the connected life safety services. It looks after them so it can all be maintained. If you get a break in one of the sounder circuits, um, it can tell you. So. Um, the future. Um, basically, that there that's where we are. The, the the building of the future. This is where we're at. Um, it's it's what we refer to now as as smart buildings. Um, run your buildings from a coffee shop. So if you're sitting in your coffee shop and you're an FM company, you can watch over everything that's happened in all the all your portfolio of buildings. Um, the buildings are actually going to be better if we start introducing this level of technology. They're actually safer now that when when we bu when we built them, we we assumed um, that they were at their safest. We can actually make them safer than when they were actually built if we start adopting this kind of thing. Enhanced experience for the occupants. One of the things that they use this for in America as well, um, back over our friends over the sea. Um, they also use it so that depending on when you go into certain buildings and certain sites, there's a particular site in uh, the southern part of Central America somewhere. It's massive. It's like a small village. And as you go in and you log your phone on your own personal mobile phone, it downloads a map and it shows you where you are in relation to the buildings. There might be a campus of 25 different buildings and it shows you where you are on a map. So you can type in where you want to go and it shows you how to get around that campus site. Um, so it's an enhanced experience uh, for the occupants in there. That same app is the one that the people can see, uh, that the fire and rescue service can see where you are, because when they log in and they come in, they can see who's in what building and where they are. Um, and accommodating change in future needs. Buildings are living environments that constantly evolve. Um, Honeywell Forge is built to accommodate that change. <clears throat> it's what we're trying to do. Um, I think now there should be another self-test video. Uh, this is a little video showing you. This is what I was talking about with a detector that can test itself. Once again, there's narrative that I'm guessing that you can't hear. Rosemary, are yeah, you seeing the video? No, no, no sound, unfortunately, Mick. I apologize. Basically, what he's showing you is by walking into the room and looking at it rather than having to go and test them. As remotely as he is, he's not having to walk around with a pole and stick it up. <clears throat> he's wandering around with no disruption to the people in the building and whatever. And he's testing all of those devices. The system's testing itself. There's um, this bit of video is showing how the thermistor techs itself. This is also how <clears throat> the smoke and the little fan whirring around. That's showing smoke going into the cell. So it's detecting it. <clears throat> It's also checking the smoke ingress and egress points to make sure it's not capped so that you can see that it is actually working properly. That would normally be done by a guy with a pole. Doesn't does it on its own now, so you don't have to have somebody walking into those offices. This is showing how when he walks up to the device to check it, he can see it. He's visually looking at that device. He knows it's self-tested because it's sending a note to him on his panel. He's walking up now. He can see it. When he sees it, he swipes right and it shows that it's been tested. These are the various devices on the on the loop and as he's walking around and testing them and it will do it in the order that he's doing them. So if that detector goes off into fire out of the sequence that they're meant to be tested, it will kick him out of his test and it will go into an automatic evacuation. So it's a smart system. It recognizes what's meant to be doing. So during the time that it's in test, uh, you don't isolate your fire alarm for, from, from working. It, it's still doing what it's meant to do. So <clears throat> that's the, that's where the self test is going. That's a very it's better if you hear the narrative that goes with it rather than me trying to witter over what was going on at the time. Hopefully that gave you an idea of it. Um, and I think that's uh, just about the end of it. So thank you very much indeed for listening. Um, have we got any questions? 
Thank you, Mick. I'm just wondering if any questions are coming in at all. No, nothing if, at the moment. If there are none so far, I'm going to give myself a pat on the back for having covered absolutely everything that anybody <laughs> could possibly have thought of asking, rather than feel upset that I've put everyone to sleep. Oh, oh, no, like so you've, yeah, can we have the oh, link to the video? Yeah, so maybe we'll we'll sort that one out ourselves. I think uh, can we we'll see if we can get the um, absolutely. I don't see any working. reason. <clears throat> I don't see any reason why not. Um, yes, I'm absolutely sure we can. How do we oh, go about send, doing that then? Do I send yeah, them if on you, to you if, then, Rosemary? Yeah, if you send it through to me, and then I can send it out with the um, the link to recording and stuff to people as well, so they can they can get that. Fantastic. Okay, I think that's it for now. So. Uh, I'd like to thank Mick and thank everyone who's joined us this morning. Oh, hold on. No. Oh, that, they've just put their, uh, their email address in. Oh, fine. okay. Fantastic. Sorry. Um, yeah, so if anyone's viewed today's um, session and I think they'll be pleased to come, please do share the link with them so they can catch up at their leisure. Um, it has been recorded and with Mick's permission, that will be uploaded onto our, um, our YouTube channel, which will be sent out to everybody who has logged in today. A link will be sent later on today, if not tomorrow. Um, if you get any feedback on any webinars or any sessions you'd like to see us cover, any specific topics or regulations, please get in touch with us via webinars at cbuilde.com. Or if you think yourself you could present one of our webinars, then again, please get in touch with us. So I'll leave that there. So thank you again very much to Mick for his informative session. And um, we bid you good. Thank you very much. <laughs>